Welcome. This is the One Year Bible for reading for November 30th, and I'm excited to start out this morning in the book of Daniel in chapter 7, right at the start of chapter 7. This is a section of scripture that is so exciting to me um, because it shows prophecy uh, that was all future for Daniel, uh, but basically looks at the kingdoms of the earth from the time of the Babylonians to the coming of Christ and even beyond that into areas that have yet to be fulfilled. But we will see this morning how this dream that Daniel had, and by the way, he's always been the interpreter of dreams, correct? But this is actually a dream, a prophetic dream that he has had and is a participant in. So that's different than what we have seen to date. Um, but we will see how this dream has had prophetic fulfillment already. Earlier during, the, oh, let me tell you. So the, we're going back in time. This is back during the reign of Belshazzar. So back to the Babylonian reign. And uh, Daniel at this point in time is about 67 years old. Earlier during the first year of Ke King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he lay in his bed. He wrote the dream down and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off and it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground like a human being and a human mind was given to it. Then I saw a second beast and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I heard a voice saying to it, get up, devour many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared and it looked like a leopard. It had four wings like bird's wings on its back and it had four heads. Great authority was given to this beast. Then in my vision that night, I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled what was left beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were wrenched out, roots and all, to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow and his hair like the whitest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire flowed from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him and a hundred million stood to attend him. Then the court began its session and the books were opened. I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. As for the other three beasts, their authority was taken from them, but they were allowed to live for a while longer. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone who looked like a man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and royal power over all the nations of the world, so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled by all I had seen, and my visions terrified me. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and asked him what it all meant. He explained it to me like this. These four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. Now, there are great parallels here between the statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of and these four beasts. So I'll try to interject what these are. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast. Actually, I'll, I'll interject them right here. So that first beast, the lion with eagle's wings, was uh, thought to be the country there, the kingdom of Babylon. The second beast was like a bear, and it was a lopsided bear with one side greater than the other, and that was the Medo-Persian Empire 
that the Persians tended to take strength as the kingdom grew. So one side grew greater than the other. And then the leopard with the four wings and the four heads was the Greek empire led by Alexander the Great. Uh, the leopard, because of such speed at which he took the kingdoms of the world. And then on his death, it was divided into four different uh, heads, uh, which is just so cool, isn't it? And then um, this fourth beast with the iron teeth, uh, thought to be the Roman Empire. Remember the, the legs of iron. So Daniel asks about the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one so different from the others and so terrifying. It devoured and crushed its victims with iron teeth and bronze claws, and it trampled what was left beneath its feet. I also asked about the ten horns on the fourth beast's head and the little horn that came up afterward and destroyed three of the other horns. This was the horn that seemed greater than the others and had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and was defeating them until the Ancient One came and judged in favor of the holy people of the Most High. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. Then he said to me, this fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings that will rule that empire. Then another king will rise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and wear down the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. But then the court will pass judgment and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. They will rule forever and all rulers will serve and obey them. That was the end of the vision. I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts and my face was pale with fear, but I kept these things to myself. Now, depending on your view of eschatology and your understanding of where we are in the kingdom of God at this moment uh, will uh, affect your interpretation of that final beast. Um, but most uh, pre-millennialists pre believe that this is the final kingdom to come, and many look toward the European Union as the vestige of the Roman Empire, waiting for 10 countries to rise up, and then the Antichrist to subdue three of them. And that, according to my understanding, is where we are at the moment. So we're waiting for that future fulfillment. We are going to begin today, First John, and so I'll give you a little background on that. So this was written by John, one of Jesus's 12 original disciples. He was probably the disciple whom Jesus loved and had a very special relationship with Jesus. This letter was written between AD 85 and 90 from Ephesus before John's exile to the island of Patmos, which we will read about soon in Revelation. Jerusalem had been destroyed in AD 70, and Christians were scattered throughout the empire. By the time John wrote this letter, Christianity had been around for more than a generation. It had faced and survived severe persecution. The main problem confronting the church at this time was declining commitment. Many believers were conforming to the world's standards, failing to stand up for Christ, and compromising their faith. False teachers were plentiful and they were accelerating the church's downward slide away from the Christian faith. John wrote this letter to put believers back on track to show the difference between light and darkness. I hope you can still hear me. Light and darkness, truth and error, and to encourage the church to grow in true love for God and for one another. He also wrote to assure believers true believers, that they possessed eternal life and to help them know that their faith was genuine so they could enjoy all the benefits of being God's children. 1 John chapter 1. The one who existed from the beginning is the one we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. 
He is Jesus Christ, the word of life. This one who is life from God was shown to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and announce to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was shown to us. We are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy will be complete. This is the message he has given us to announce to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not living in the truth. But if we are living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ is, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. If we say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just for, to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Psalm 119, starting in verse 153. Look down upon my sorrows and rescue me, for I have not forgotten your law. Argue my case, take my side, protect my life as you promised. The wicked are far from salvation, for they do not bother with your principles. Lord, how great is your mercy. In your justice, give me back my life. Many persecute and trouble me, yet I have not swerved from your decrees. I hate these traitors because they care nothing for your word. See how I love your commandments, Lord. Give back my life because of your unfailing love. All your words are true. All your just laws will stand forever. Powerful people harass me without cause, but my heart trembles only at your word. I rejoice in your word like one who finds great treasure. I hate and abhor all falsehood, but I love your law. I will praise you seven times a day because your laws are just. Those who love your law have great peace and do not stumble. I love and I long for your salvation, Lord, I, so I have obeyed your commands. I have obeyed your decrees and I love them very much. Yes, I obey your commandments and decrees because you know everything I do. O oh Lord, listen to my cry. Give me the discerning mind you promised. Listen to my prayer. Rescue me as you promised. Let my lips burst forth with praise, for you have taught me your principles. Let my lips burst, oh, sorry, let my tongue sing about your word, for all your commands are right. Stand ready to help me, for I have chosen to follow your commandments. O oh Lord, I have longed for your salvation, and your law is my delight. Let me live so I can praise you, and may your laws sustain me. I have wandered away like a lost sheep. Come and find me, for I have not forgotten your commands. Proverbs 28, 23, and 24. In the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. Robbing your parents and then saying, what's wrong with that, is as serious as committing murder. And to end, we have one last selection from Selwyn Hughes for a while anyway, and it is called The Danger of Denial from John chapter 8, verse 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It may be difficult for some of you to admit that perhaps your heart and your head are not spiritually coordinated. Many Christians are content to live above the waterline and insist that it is quite unnecessary to wrestle and struggle with the things that go on deep inside us. Their motto is, just trust, persevere, and obey. This is fine as far as it goes, but in my opinion, it does not go far enough. The effect of this teaching is to blunt the painful reality of what the Bible says about the condition of the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. That's Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. It is possible for even mature Christians to be self-deceived. And this is why we must live in constant dependence on God and invite him from time to time, as the psalmist did, to search me and know my heart. Psalm 139, 23. 
There is a word to describe the attitude of those who ignore what may be going on deep inside them and concentrate only on what they can see above the waterline, and that word is denial. In many Christian circles, maintaining a comfortable distance from what may be going on deep down inside is strongly encouraged, but nothing can be gained from denial. In fact, I would say it is one of the major reasons why our feet are not like hind's feet and why we slip and slide on the slopes that lead upward to a deeper understanding and knowledge of God. God, we realize we are dealing with something too devastating to pass over quickly or lightly. Help us to be aware of the tendency that is in us to deny that, uh, that we deny. Stay close to us at this moment, dear Father, for without you, we can do nothing. Amen. Love you all. Have a beautiful day.